All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining the uh, live peer community call this week. Uh, for those who uh, are joining for the first time, or for those who are watching the stream, uh, we host bi-weekly live peer community calls. They're open to all. Anyone can join the Hangout. Um, we kind of organize by submitting agenda topics in advance through our, our Discord. Uh, and then we set an agenda. And then we spend about you know, 30 to 45 minutes going through, letting people ask questions, having an active discussion, pretty informal. Um, so I think this week, um, Nelson can maybe jump in if he wants to kind of set the table. But I think we were going to cover updates on Streamflow. We're going to get an update on Aircon and some governance and sustainability and open source related topics. Um, we can talk about a parameter change proposal, increasing the number of transmitters on the live peer network, and uh, plenty of time for QA or any topics people want to talk about. Sound right, Nelson? Yes, sounds right, Doug. Awesome. So uh, thanks for coordinating and organizing as, as usual. Um, I'll kind of kick it over to you and you can. Take it from here. Okay, brilliant. Thanks for that. Um, so yeah, so I look to get started. Um, we were just going to get like a bit of a general update from the team um, on how things are going. So I think I was passing that on to uh, you, Eric. Yep. Yep. All right. Um, so I will I will give everyone an update on what's been happening with um, our engineering progress um, and 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 with Streamflow. Um, so just to give everyone an uh, overview and review of what Streamflow is and what we're trying to accomplish with this release, uh, we want to have scalability of transcoding. Uh, and we have an internal, uh, internal um, kind of milestone of having over 50,000 concurrent video streams running on our network. Uh, the reason we picked that number is because that's about the, um, at the max, uh, how much video Twitch handles 50,000 concurring incoming streams. Um, we want to have we want to have the transcoding super affordable, right? So that uh, our internal goal is to have a 10 times uh, a, 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 the transcoder to be 10 times cheaper than the current uh, SaaS solution. So right now, uh, right, currently it costs about $3 per hour per stream to do the transcoding. Our goal is to have it less than 30 cents. Um, we also want to have reliability. So that means we want uh, internal goal is we want to have 99.9% .9 of all the video trans uh, video segments transcoded successfully. Uh, and we also want um, more decentralization in the network. Uh, so that means more active nodes on the network uh, beyond this immediate proposal of um, of uh, expanding the, the number of nodes to just 25, uh, to 25 active nodes from the current 15. Uh, we want to expand to uh, hundreds or even thousands later on. Um, and, and to achieve these scalability, affordability, reliability, and decentralization goals, uh, we have uh, a few uh, approaches that we're taking to solve these problems. Um, a big a big approach, uh, a big um, project that we've been working on is um, this mechanism called probabilistic micropayments. Um, and this is a layer, uh, we, we can see this as a layer two payment solution that uh, bypasses the Ethereum scalability challenges. So some, um, some people have maybe have heard of um, lightning networks or state channels or uh, things, uh, plasma even, things like that. Probabilistic micropayment is another way to do this. Uh, and it's a very simple but effective mechanism that allows us to uh, release the protocol really quickly and get into market uh, with uh, with a scale uh, with with a protocol that can scale to um, uh, fifty thousand concurrent streams, having them all paying at the same time and not be slowed down by the Ethereum um, by the Ethereum transaction uh, bottleneck. Another project, uh, another approach that we're taking is a new verification and challenge model for uh, this verification of um, video that's transcoded. Uh, and the high level, uh, and the high level um, I guess, description there is before we were doing the challenge uh, probabilistically. Uh, so, so imagine if we, um, if, if we said we want to have randomly every 1,000 1, segments being challenged, then every 1,000 se 1, segments into the network 
uh, has to be has to go through this challenge process, and that can be expensive. Then in the new in the new challenge model, um, things uh, segments are only challenged when the broadcaster detects there is a fault. Right. So in this scenario, it's possible that no video ever gets challenged uh, if everyone is acting honestly. And if that's the case, uh, there's a dramatic decrease in the amount of cost associated with the entire network uh, in order to kind of police the system. Uh, and the, the analogy I, want, I like to give is like kind of the police force in a very safe town, right? Like the police force needs to be there, but then uh, it, the, the police force might never act because the town is very safe. Uh, but you need to have a good, good police force to enforce the safety in this town. Um, another um, project that we've been working on is this idea of a service registry. Uh, and this is combined with uh, a, new, a new workflow that allows an off-chain job negotiation uh, instead of the current model where every new stream that comes into the network has to rely on a new transaction on the Ethereum network to create this job. Uh, in the new model, all the job creations will be happening off-chain and offline, uh, off the off the network, um, but still using cryptogra uh, cryptographic primitives to ensure the security of of these job creations. And what that allows us to do is to have this um, video broadcasting workflow completely off-chain and not uh, not have to rely on the Ethereum blockchain at all. And this really uh, gives us a lot of scale. Um, and, and, and speed when it comes to the network. And finally, uh, another approach that we're taking is hor this horizontal scaling approach. So we, um, we are, um, instead of every node um, on, the, on chain representing just one single processing node, um, in, the new, in, in, in Streamflow, every node on the network represents an orchestrator. And this orchestrator can represent thousands of transcoders behind it. And the orchestrator's job is to operate, um, is to kind of talk to the blockchain and broker the job that's coming in so that um, it can utilize a, a large, for example, a large data center in order to uh, process all the video that's coming in. And this allows us to horizontally scale uh, the, the amount of processing power that's uh, on the network. So, so those are some pretty ambitious and, and great goals. Um, so um, I want to report on some of the progress that we've been making. Um, so just this week, um, we have, a ch uh, so we've been working on this um, minimum, vi we call it the minimum viable stream flow um, uh, construction. Uh, and then the idea is we just want to have an end-to-end -end workflow that actually works. Uh, and in and, and the next phase, we'll work on like improving the security, improving the, the performance. Uh, and currently, uh, we are we're able to, handle 100 concurrent video streams with 95% success rate. And this is a huge improvement because until now, uh, we were only able to handle, uh, the, for the entire network, maybe up to 10 to 15 streams, just limited by the number of nodes that are um, number of active uh, transcoders on the network. But now, uh, with, um, with, with, uh, with this minimum viable stream flow, we're already able to uh, scale to 100 concurrent video streams at 95% success rate. Um, we've also been working on um, a project uh, that we're internally called uh, Test Harness. Uh, Yaya has been working a lot on this. Uh, and, the, and, and this is a, a tool for us to not only test a large deployment of the live peer cluster, um, but it, it also allows us to actually deploy Live peer at scale uh, on cloud infrastructure. Uh, so this is really good for operators who wants to operate live peer at scale, and also really great for internal testing and deployment on the cloud infrastructure. So we've been working on this tool for a while, and it's it's been really helpful for uh, for us in, uh, for our internal engineering team. Uh, looking at the next step, um, the next the next phase um, of of Streamflow is what we call scaled Streamflow. Uh, and the idea here is we want to have complete feature. Uh, we want to we want to be feature complete and have code uh, have the code frozen after um, after we're finished with this phase, so that we're able to do uh, a, a a good and rigorous security audit uh, and external tests 
uh, before launching uh, scale uh, Streamflow on onto mainnet. And currently, uh, we've been doing a lot of in internal engineering planning to figure out um, all the all the necessary engineering tasks that we need to do in order to bring uh, in, in order to bring our network to feature complete uh, feature completion. Um, another thing that we're starting to work on is to start to serve pilot customers. So these are um, so so in the past nine months, uh, LivePeer has been really successful running in the wild, um, kind of live on the Ethereum mainnet and uh, serving mostly a lot of real world crypto events. Um, so for example, like what we're doing right now, we're broadcasting on, uh, on LivePeer. Uh, last year, a lot of the side track uh, side um, technical tracks at DevCon was streamed on LivePeer, uh, and, and many, many other decentralized events were, were, were done uh, on the LivePeer network as well. But uh, what, we're work, what we're starting to work on now is really to work with real-world applications, applications that don't even necessarily come from this decentralized world, but have a um, have you know tens to hundreds of concurrent video streams, live streams going into their network. Uh, and we're uh, we're ready to talk to them and serve them today. So these are exam uh, these are um, example that these examples are you know Twitch or you know Fubo TV, Periscope, any type of these live streaming applications. Um, so some of the things that uh, I think um, we're interested to getting help from the community. Uh, one is um, we're we're opening up the research process for the probabilistic micropayment mechanism to the wider Ethereum ecosystem. Uh, we think this is a this is this is a generic payment mechanism that can help many different projects and not just live here. Basically, any project that requires a micropayment mechanism uh, and and that's repeated and um, can can utilize this mechanism. Uh, we've been doing a lot of great research internally, um, and I think um, it will be really helpful for for a few projects to be to be collaborating on this thing. Uh, another. Um, Another is that uh, we're starting to talk to pilot customers. So uh, if you are um, if you are working on a video app, or if you know a video app that can really benefit from uh, from this affordable and scalable infrastructure let, that LifePeer provides, um, please please let us know and introduce introduce them to us. Uh, we'd love to have them on board as design partners and early early customers to help us bring LifePeer to the mainstream. Uh, so that is my uh, quick update. Okay, awesome, Eric. Thanks for that. That's really helpful. Um, all right, so next we might pass it on to Yondin, who is going to give us a bit of an update on, on Aracon. Does anyone have any questions on Streamflow or anything they're wondering about after that uh, nice update from Eric? Okay, right. cool. Right. I must have done a good job. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So should I get started? Uh, yeah, yeah, that would be awesome. Cool. So um, yeah, so I so I'm Yandin. I'm a researcher and engineer here at LivePeer. And a couple weeks ago in at the end of January. I had spent a few days in Berlin attending Aragon, which is a conference organized by the Aragon team. For those that don't know them, uh, they're an Ethereum-based project building tools to facilitate the creation of DAOs, uh, as well as uh, hopefully the first digital jurisdiction composed of multiple DAOs. And the conference itself was focused on decentralized organizations and governance generally. And I was primarily attending the conference to speak on a panel on open source sustainability, but I also spent a bunch of time catching up with people, working on different things in the space, watching talks. And yeah, I figured it might be helpful to just go over some of my general observations and learnings from the conference in case anyone is interested in these types of topics. So first off, in terms of general observations, it was pretty amazing to see how much the Aragon community has grown considering that this is a specific application built on top of Ethereum. 
And there are numerous comparisons made between the attendance of this particular conference and DEF CON 2, which was two years ago in Shanghai. And that was around the time that popularity of Ethereum had just started picking up. And they, I believe they had a one-track conference at the time, but attending Ericon, uh, similarly, it was a one-track conference, but there was just so much enthusiasm and multiple projects in the space that were working on things within the broader Aragon ecosystem. So I'd say uh, it was a fantastic job by the Aragon team. And one thing that I would know is that they are a team that is remote first. So there is no home base for their team and everyone is distributed. And I think part of the reason why they might have found success in that model thus far is kind of like their commitment to the initial culture and vision that the project was originally started with. And everyone that either works on the team or works on a project within that ecosystem seems very, very much to have the same ideological alignment, uh, which probably contributes to their ability to coordinate despite being geographically separated. So that was a pretty, that was, that was an observation on my part. And then moving on to more conference specific topics, uh, open source sustainability was a topic of conversation. Uh, I participated in a panel along with a few other people from the Ethereum, Ethereum ecosystem talking about what it means uh, when you say open source sustainability, what it means for both Ethereum and cryptocurrency ecosystem and beyond. And the panel was fairly well received in terms of attendee reception. Uh, but open source sustainability is such a complex and multifaceted topic that I think it's worth touching on a few things that weren't in the panel for anyone that's interested in watching the panel on YouTube, um, but ended up being talked about in offline conversations. So I think one of those things is like the importance of social processes and culture of any open source project, even if it's not cryptocurrency or Ethereum or blockchain related. And I think ultimately a continued source of funding is a necessary ingredient for open source sustainability, but it's not the only ingredient for open source sustainability. You very, can, you very well can have a diverse set of funding sources for an open source project, but if the management and social processes and culture of the project is dysfunctional, then all those funds are going to end up being misallocated at the very end of the day. And I think this is a problem common in open source generally, and I think especially in the blockchain ecosystem, considering that a lot of these projects are fairly young and emerging, uh, this is something that I think is worth taking into account when people are thinking about how to create one of these sustainable projects. Uh, I think some interesting case studies that I talked to with a few people on this topic, um, once again, not blockchain related, but I think there are many lessons that can be learned are kind of looking to successful traditional open source projects and contrasting how they're managed with other successful open source projects, but the perception around how healthy the community is very different. So one example is if you take uh, from the programming language ecosystem, if you compare Go with Rust, uh, even though plenty of people like using Go uh, and there's a large community of people that use Go, the development roadmap for Go is basically a product of the Google core team. And even though it is an open source project by name, the development is really not so much community driven as more so driven by Google based upon their own agenda that they try to factor in community input, but it's really not so much a community driven project so much as a company driven project that happens to be open source and there's a large community around it. And then you can contrast that with Rust which a lot of people have highlighted as kind of like a shining example of, it's not perfect, but it is a good example of the direction that a lot of people want these sustainable open source projects to go. So Rust was started by a few employees at Mozilla, but at the same time, they tried to make it as much as possible a community driven project. And they ultimately created an RFC system that more or less uh, people that have participated in multiple RFC systems seem to have good feedback for the system that they created. Uh, there's a great video from two of the leaders at Rust from Mozilla talking about what it, all the mistakes that they made in the early days 
of rust that led to uh, various unfortunate or uncomfortable situations involving the community. But ultimately, those served as lessons for them. And I think one of the most interesting takeaways I got from watching that video was the need to, or the power of leading by articulating a clear vision while acknowledging that just because you're the one articulating the clear vision, it doesn't mean that you're the one that has all the answers. And then thinking about leadership paths for every newcomer that comes in, as opposed to kind of having them contribute, but not really having a path for them to become something more than just a one-time contributor. Um, so I think those are some of the topics that were interesting to discuss with people on the side tracks uh, after the panel. And an additional topic that was heavily discussed at the conference was what all these Ethereum and cryptocurrency projects are gonna look like in a multi-blockchain world. So uh, as some people on this call might be aware of, uh, Ethereum has this, Ether has this like 2.0 roadmap that they plan on, where they plan on migrating from what is now Ethereum 1.0 to Ethereum 2.0. And Ethereum 2.0 is what's called a sharded system, where you can think of each each shard as its own individual blockchain. And these blockchains are composed together into this network of blockchains. And this is a pretty similar approach to uh, what is being used at other projects that aren't Ethereum based, such as Cosmos or the Polkadot project that is being spearheaded by the Parity team. And there was an interesting talk by Will Warren from Zero X who highlighted some of their current thinking for what Zero X, which is a decentralized exchange protocol, will look like in a multi-blockchain world, given the fact that their decentralized exchange protocol is, their goal is to support value transfer for the entire world, regardless of what blockchain that you live on and regardless what asset that you want to trade. So it's actually highly critical for them to be able to support uh, all these different assets that might be living on different blockchains and not just individual assets living on a single blockchain. So this is actually paramount for them. So there's a great video of his talk online that people should check out, but he basically went over uh, what zero, the zero X protocol would look like and how it would basically live on multiple blockchains simultaneously in order to facilitate this value transfer. And while this is obviously particularly crucial for a project like zero X, given their mission, uh, I think the reality is that given the push towards Ethereum 2.0 and the upcoming release of Polkadot and Cosmos that we are just going to live in a multi-blockchain world eventually. And this is something that developers should care about because depending on the details of this paradigm shift, your development workflow and how you think about system design and how you think about the protocols that you want to create might vary drastically depending on those details. So I think this was a topic of discussion at the conference and there's definitely a lot of questions on the table and these are questions that need to be answered in order for developers to be productive uh, whenever these um, Ethereum 2.0 or Polkadot or Cosmos projects go live. Uh, but generally, I think it's probably better to be thinking about this sooner rather than later, even though in your short-term roadmap, you might have plans to release before any of this stuff even happens. But the reality seems to be that in the long term, this is something that you'll need to care about uh, no matter what. So the sooner that you think about how this imp impacts your architecture, the better off you are from a long-term perspective. Um, yeah, so I think that was the other like pretty popular discussion topic at the conference. And then besides that, I enjoyed uh, hearing about some of the projects that were being funded by grants in the Aragon ecosystem. I think one of note for me was this project called Frame which is an operating system level Ethereum signer. So think MetaMask, except instead of having a browser extension, manage your private keys and handle signing transactions whenever you interact with a web-based app. You actually have the signing logic live uh, on your desktop and your private keys are managed at uh, your local computer level layer instead of um, within the browser itself. 
And it was pretty cool watching the demo for this because it was a single developer that had been working on this for a few months that had created a pretty slick UI that seemed pretty usable and they just launched their mainnet alpha. So if people are interested in that type of tooling, would encourage you to check it out. Um, but I think that's just like a taste of some of the interesting projects that have been funded by the Aragon Grants program. Uh, and I'm sure that there are others that I can't possibly go through in this call alone. Uh, but there's a lot of cool stuff happening. Um, yeah, so I think that's like kind of like a whirlwind tour and summary of my experience at Aragon. Uh, if anyone finds any of these topics interesting, feel free to uh, bring them up or yeah, contact me offline if you want to chat about it more. Awesome. Jan, and back to the, the Rust versus Go examples, what were some concrete things that the Rust community did to provide these kind of clear paths from off contributor to actually having some ownership or responsibility within the product roadmap? Um, I think one of the non-obvious things that they mentioned was just like highlighting that something was even highlighting the actual opportunities to take ownership for things. And I think the example that one of them gave was that at one point, um, the release management for Rust was handled by a single person. There, but there were no details, there were no details uh, written down anywhere of like who was handling release management, why release management was important, and if there are any opportunities to help with release management. So there was just a single guy that I think was from Mozilla that was handling all this stuff. And he did a great job, but obviously he got overwhelmed over time because there's so many other things to work on. And this ended up becoming, I think, a bottleneck for them because this one guy was being overwhelmed by work, but didn't have the opportunity and didn't have the opportunity to allocate time to anything else. But there were never any like community members that actually helped work on it because there was never any indication that this was a problem that needed help with in the first place. And there was no guidance or outline of like, oh, if I'm interested in this or if this is a crucial area of the code base that needs help, uh, what I would even like do to like engage with someone. And I think what they found was that when they actually documented this stuff and then when they started to actually like write out descriptions that didn't assume any internal knowledge and didn't make any assumptions about like who knows what everyone else is doing at this point in time and created more like accessible outlines of like, oh, what are the different areas that uh, we need help in that they actually started having people just volunteer to contribute to that area. And then they eventually grew that team to like, it, it's now like a multi person team, like that original guy is still on that release management team, but now it's him and then maybe like a handful of other people that kind of dove into the process after they after they just made it more clear what was available to work on. So I feel like that that seems like an obvious thing, but I feel like it's very easily like missed, just like focusing on clarity and accessibility of the actual problems that people need help on. Do you have an idea of how big the Rust team is? Like how many people work on it? Uh, I don't, well, I, I don't know how big like the, well, yeah, I don't know how many contributors there are to Rust, uh, but I know that the team at Mozilla that works on Rust full time is much smaller than the, like there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, consistent contributors, and I believe maintainers as well that have no affiliation with Mozilla. Because I would imagine like the Go team at Google is like, I don't know, 40, 50 people at least. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how the sizes of the team compare. I actually did a quick search now, and I think the way they rank it is by how many commits each individual has contributed. And so there's actually a list of everyone who has ever made a commit to the Rust repository. And I can just put it on the chat. Yeah, I think so. On the, on the topic of 
go. I thought like one particular piece of news or like an event that I read about that was interesting for anyone that's interested was that uh, maybe a couple of months ago or maybe at the end of the summer, there was a bunch of like Twitter drama because there was um, this guy who worked on, I think, GoDep, which was uh, a third party Go package versioning tool. And he had like worked a lot on this versioning tool and was making a push for including like what he believed to be the right way to handle package versioning within Go to be included in the Go master release. And I guess he had been communicating with Russ Cox, who was the lead at Go for a while. And ba uh, based upon what he released on Twitter, he basically just talked about how like, he had made like continued efforts to interact with the Google core team, including Russ Cox, in order to kind of push forward this package versioning story. Um, but then after a period of time, um, there was kind of radio silence and there wasn't much communication or feedback back and forth anymore. So he had, didn't really have any insight as to what was going on. And then eventually like the Go team made the announcement of what they think is the right way to handle package versioning and the all the stuff relating to like go dep and that flavor of package versioning was just left as like a footnote in like the entire uh, announcement and i think there was a degree of just like i think there was just like a negative reception to that and kind of this perception that there wasn't a very healthy dialogue back and forth and there wasn't a very like healthy community process. And it very much was, okay, we'll have this conversation and this is an interesting conversation, but okay, now I have a separate idea that I think is better, so I'm just gonna do that. And I don't think your idea is good at all. And then there ends up being radio silence. And then the next time, they hear, next time that you hear about it, like there's no chance that your idea is gonna make it in at all. So I thought that was just like an interest, obviously there is another side to this story, but I think it was just an interesting example of like, regardless of what the other side of the story, this guy feels like he got uh, snubbed by like, like the core maintenance team. And I think especially if you have that type of attitude and that type of reception perception propagate through the rest of the community, that doesn't bode very well for uh, the perception of the core team that's working on it. If they want to have this be a community-driven project. If they don't want it to be a community-driven project, then that's a different story. But uh, I think that type of reception, regardless of what the other side of the story is, doesn't exactly send positive signals about the community-driven process for this project. Okay, great. And did anyone have any other questions for Yondan about Aracon? Hey, Yandan. Um, awesome recap. Uh, thanks. I had a question. Um, you mentioned one of your, your big takeaways was um, how important it is for projects to think about how they might exist in this sort of multi blockchain world. Um, I was wondering if you guys have put any thought into how um, this affects life here. Yeah, so I think that's an interesting question. And I think. So I think with the Streamflow release, I think the time the timeline for the Streamflow release is such that it's not something that we would incorporate this multi-blockchain view immediately into that release. But I definitely think it would be something that is on the docket for research and consideration post Streamflow. Uh, with regards to what the architecture would actually look like, I don't have any concrete details of what that would look like, but it's interesting to consider that uh, what are kind of like the two crucial components of live peer? There is this payment payment component because within this two-sided marketplace, you need to be able to pay for transcoding work. And in order for that payment component to exist, you need to have some sort of settlement layer on the bottom in order to handle that value transfer. Uh, and then the other component has to do with coordination and that's staking because the core value proposition for staking in addition to economic security is to help coordinate how work gets allocated across this network. So I think the latter component is a little harder to think about, uh, but talking about the first component, 
Um, all that's kind of necessary in the underlying layer in order to support this payment component is a settlement layer. And that could, in theory, be that doesn't necessarily need to be wedded to any particular blockchain. It just needs to happen to support whatever payment protocol that we're using. So for example, for probabilistic micropayments, in order to enable probabilistic micropayments, it's easier. It's much easier to do it on an EVM compatible chain. So Ethereum facilitates that. But let's say that in like Ethereum 2.0, you have a world of like multiple EVM compatible chains. Um, there isn't really any strict coupling uh, of like live peer with any one of those EVM compatible chains, like you could, you might be able to have like this payment process be settled on any of these EVM compatible chains, depending on like how congested any given one of these chains is. I think the slightly harder thing to reason about is the coordination component via staking, um, because you kind of want to have coordination be global and you want all the state associated with staking to be living in a single pace, place as opposed to being dispersed in more of like a federated network. Because I think kind of like one of the, as Eric mentioned, like one of the things that we want to enable in Streamflow is this service registry where you go to a single place to discover and find orchestrators to work with, and then it provides you metadata information for how that work should be allocated. And that becomes a little harder if you have that dispersed across multiple areas and that state is split up. And it's a little easier if you have that state live in a single place. So maybe that is an example of something that should, should live on its own chain as opposed to have that state be broken up somehow. Um, but yeah, those are just some like high level thoughts, obviously no concrete details or anything, but I think this will be something that would be actively researched, uh, as a part of something that comes after Streamflow. Makes sense. Yeah. That's super interesting. Thanks. Um, okay. Brilliant. Uh, so now the final thing we wanted to talk about was, um, we wanted to have a brief discussion on the proposal to increase the number of transcoders from 15 to 20, sorry, 25. Um, so Doug, uh, would you mind just giving a quick recap on why, um, why the team feels it's a good idea to implement this now? Uh, we've already, there's already been a little bit of discussion on this on the forum. Yeah, sure thing. So um, about a week and a half ago, we shared a proposal that a lot of people in the community had been asking for or talking about for a long time, which is to increase the number of active transcoders from 15, where it is today, up to 25. And um, it was kind of proposed that the change would take place in uh, about two weeks in round number 1061. Um, actually, interesting side point, that because uh, the Ethereum Ice Age has set in prior to the upcoming hard fork, Rounds are taking about eight hours longer than a day. And so um, we're still seven rounds away. And that may take about nine days um, before we get to this round. So you know, not looking at next Wednesday, but looking at potentially next weekend for when this proposal would take effect. But in any case, uh, there's a number of reasons for this proposal. Uh, first of all, the network launched nine months ago as an alpha with a small set of transcoders in order to test the network in order to make sure that a small set we're running software correctly to find bugs, to make sure we're in security issues, to keep the cost on Ethereum down, et cetera. But as the protocol has been running um, you know, successfully and it's been slightly iterated on, so bugs have been fixed over the last nine months, things have been pretty stable. Um, and now there's a few reasons why it might be a good time to upgrade uh, the number of nodes on the network. So one is to increase the decentralization of the network to have kind of more staked um, parties who are participating in different locations with different interests um, and giving delegators different choices of who to allocate work to. Um, also, because of all the inflation and because it's all kind of been staked to the same 15 nodes, uh, there's kind of a high barrier to entry right now. You need uh, 30,000 plus LPT in order to actually, actually break into the active set. And that really high bar is actually discouraging to new kind of qualified, interested parties to even try because uh, it's so unlikely that they'd be able to attract that stake. And so by increasing the size, we can kind of lower that bar, allow more people to begin to be familiar with playing the role. 
uh, and the reason it's important that more nodes are familiar with how to do this role is because in Streamflow, um, the plan when that goes to mainnet is that the order of magnitude of, of orchestrators will actually increase drastically. So, you know, well beyond 25 to hundreds or even you know, eventually up to thousands of, of nodes on this network. And since that's going to happen, it'll be really helpful um, if there are more parties who can learn to play this role today, you can participate in testing stream flow, feedback, find, find bugs, run on test nets. Um, it'll really help kind of the, the process of getting stream flow to mainnet. Um, and it feels like this is kind of a, a low risk upgrade in that the protocols run stably and consistently for many hundreds of rounds. Um, we've already done an increase from 10 to 15 before. Um, there's not a lot of risk like there may have been in the super early days of, uh, of bumping this up. So those are many of the reasons kind of that motivated this, uh, this proposal. Um, now, what are some of the drawbacks? Uh, so using live peer, not for the end user, not for the broadcaster, but for the token holding delegators and for the transcoder, becomes a little more expensive, uh, particularly any time you bond or unbond or rebond your tokens. It'll cost 8% more gas than it costs today. Uh, but these are pretty infrequent actions. Like you maybe bond or unbond you know, once every few days or weeks or you know, even once a day. Um, and you know, at kind of low gas prices, like 5 GUA. It's saying the transaction might cost one penny more than it does today. Uh, so hopefully that's an acceptable trade-off uh, in favor of uh, decentralization. Uh, there's one transaction called initialize round that will become a lot more expensive. Uh, and this one's expensive to begin with. Uh, this has to happen once across the whole protocol each round, so about once a day. And uh, it'll actually become 62% more expensive and use about 4.5 million gas. So this is something that can actually cost a few dollars if gas prices go up and cost as much as $50. Uh, this is something that uh, kind of the live peer uh, core team has been subsidizing and funding will continue to do so. I think it's once a day. Uh, we're certainly willing to do it, especially until stream flow or null dynamics of the cost of this call and even the necessity of this call. Um, chain and the high cost gets eliminated is, is the hope. So uh, that's a, a slight negative, but again, I think it's worth it uh, in favor of decentralization. Um, and then you know, finally, some more minor potential drawbacks. One is uh, you know, apps and apps that may have hard-coded how many active transcoders there are uh, may need to update so that the UX uh, is consistent after the change. We'll you know, let everyone know, we'll let them know. Um, as the, the date approaches, uh, hopefully you don't see any major breakage, but maybe some minor UX glitches here and there. And then um, finally, the active transcoders themselves, many of whom indicate they fully support this change. You know, if the inflationary token are being distributed across more nodes, they may see you know, slightly less um, tokens flowing to themselves because the pie is being split. Uh, across a you know, wider number of stakeholders. Again, good for the decentralization of the network, but you know, if you're fortunate enough to have one of those 15 active slots right now, um, you know, over, over time, you may not be able to just kind of coast and easily collect quite as many rewards, but certainly we aim to move towards like this open competitive network, especially as real demand comes in after stream flow, where the people who are earning these rewards are kind of not just sitting there doing nothing, but are actually competing to provide really valuable service. Uh, so we have a you know, forum post that's been out, called for open discussion. There hasn't been too much chatter other than a few people expressing support. Um, you know, I welcome all feedback. Uh, feel free to chat on Discord, bring any questions here, chime in on the forum post. Um, certainly, you know, want the community's voice to be heard to see if there's any other concerns, any alterations to the proposal um, that need to be made. But uh, assuming there seems to be a kind of a consensus of support in favor. I expect the change to go through in round 10. It's around 12, um, here, 1260, 1261, probably about nine or 10 days from now. Any questions or comments about the proposal?
Cool. All right. So I think that's um, all the topics on the on the agenda. Was there anything else anyone wanted to ask about or discuss today? Hey, uh, this is uh, Garrett. Um, kind of a newbie question here. Um, you mentioned earlier um, that you guys are researching probabilistic uh, micropayments. Can you kind of drop, dive into it a little bit and like uh, unpack it um, just in terms of uh, what's the state of the research and uh, maybe like ideally what you think that would look like? Sure thing. Uh, thanks for joining me, uh, call it Gareth, if it's your, one of your first times here. Uh, so, probabilistic micropayments um, is kind of a old research concept that goes back maybe to the 90s even, um, kind of outside the context of blockchain, and it deals with essentially uh, the, the sender sends what equates to like lottery tickets to the recipient in exchange for service. And the uh, value of these lottery tickets if they win is pretty high, but the probability that they win is very low. And so kind of the average expected value of each ticket is the, the cost that they're charging for the value of the work that they're performing. Um, but the idea is they only have to do a transaction on chain when they actually get a winning ticket. So you do frequent transactions to kind of cash in a lot of value, but the expected value of what you pay and receive is equal to the amount of work. And so as far as the state of the research, um, you know, we, we have a minimum viable implementation. It's already running on our internal Streamflow testnet uh, and, and working well. But there are a couple open research areas. So one is full spend prevention. Um, and uh, there's a big uh, open ticket that people can weigh in on in the, um, the repository where it's being discussed. Um, there's a lot of research as to how you mitigate double spends in these, in these networks. And uh, maybe Yanni can jump in with uh, you know, a brief 60 second uh, kind of overview of where we're at. We certainly think that's kind of the main, main area. Yeah, I think so. I think there's a few interesting components of this particular scheme, but uh, luckily we have solutions to most of them, except for we have concrete solutions for most of them, except for. Uh, an ideal solution for double spend security right now. And I'd note that double spend security is a characteristic, like the need to think about double spend security is a characteristic of this scheme, uh, but it's not exclusive to this scheme. And I'd say it's basically, pr it's a concern for any type of layer two payment solution that doesn't involve locking in your recipient with a particular deposit. Um, so one of the characteristics of probabilistic micropayments is that you have a single deposit and you're using that single deposit to send offline payments to each of your recipients. And since you are sending offline payments, meaning that you're not waiting for an on-chain transaction to confirm and achieving global consensus on the state of how much uh, money is left in the sender's deposit, that means that if I send you an offline payment, um, you have to validate that somehow and you have to have some way to determine that you're not being double spent because you only have a local view of how much money I have. Um, so one of the proposed methods for handling this type of situation is in addition to having a deposit that funds the tickets that you create to pay someone, you also have this non-spendable escrow where this non-spendable escrow has a certain amount of funds in it and the rules of the system are such that if anyone can ever prove that you double spent, and double spent in this context basically can be discovered if it's ever the case that you have sent out more outstanding winning tickets than you have funds available to allocate towards those tickets. So the non-spendable escrow, if it is the case that someone proves that you have double spent and you've run out of funds, then that escrow can be slashed. So there's a question of what you should do when you actually slash that escrow. One option and the simplest option is to burn the escrow, uh, meaning that no one gets the money. 
another option would be to try to slice up the escrow into different collateral collateral allocations, where each person that you double spent against has a claim to that collateral allocation. Uh, and it's kind of similar to like how in the real world, you might give someone a, a collateralized loan. And if they can't, if they default on that loan, you can claim their collaterals. So kind of similar to that. So that's something that we've been discussing in that research problem statement that's on GitHub in the live peer slash research repo. Um, so that's one question that we need to answer. And an additional question that we need to answer is that, okay, we know that you can create this non-spendable escrow. And the idea is that if you will lose this non-spendable escrow, if you double spend, then that means that uh, you will be disincentivized from double spending. But that's only true if you if the escrow is greater or equal to than the actual amount of utility that you can gain from double spending. So utility meaning like how much extra benefit can I get from double spending? And it's important to note that um, I'm using double spend pretty liter uh, liberally here. Um, you can always you can also like paralyze that double spend such that you're double spending across multiple recipients simultaneously. So one tricky thing is okay, given the fact that you can try to do this to multiple people simultaneously, what is an adequate required escrow such that you can actually disincentivize someone? Because if the amount of utility that you can gain from double spending exceeds your escrow then you're still out of luck. Um, they still have an economic incentive for double spending. So we are currently discussing a candidate solution that was proposed in this paper from 2016 from a few academics on this topic. Um, and there's more details in the GitHub issue if you're interested and definitely more than welcome to jump into the conversation. Cool. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, okay, brilliant. Um, well, thanks to that, everyone. Um, unless we had any other questions, I think we can probably wrap it up there. Yeah, thanks for hosting right. and moderating. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys.